Um, let's just see if everybody's muted. Uh, as I say, if you've just joined, if you could mute, please, that'll be great. And morning, Rosalind. If Rosalind, if you could mute as well, that'd be great as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it's now 10.33. Uh, thanks everyone for your time this morning. Um, delighted that we've got LCP's fantastic team headed by Natalie Sims and Laura Amin. Um, I hope I said that right, Laura, by the way, so I'm uh, sorry yeah. if I'm slightly wrong. <laughs> no, we'll go with that, Steve. That's fine. Um, there we go. Excellent. Um, first things first, uh, we are recording. So could we have a thumbs up from everybody? William, Maggie, Adrian, Bob, everybody's with a recording, which is great. Uh, usual playpen fashion. Um, we've got a presentation. Delighted that uh, we'll be talking about uh, Soulmates 4. And if you want to make any comments in the chat, we'll open up the chat room. If you'd like to ask a question of Natalie or Laura, please raise a hand and Henry and I uh, will bring you in to the conversation. So without any further ado, I'll pass to Natalie, who no doubt will introduce her team. Um, we hope you enjoy the session. So thanks all for joining. Hey, thanks very much, Steve. Um, and um, welcome, everybody. So nice to see some familiar faces, some new faces here. Hopefully this will be a very interactive session. So. Uh, put in your, either raise your hand or, or I've got the chat open here if you've got any questions. But without further ado, let's kick off. And um, can I just confirm, do we have 45 minutes or an hour for this? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an hour an for hour. including okay. Q&A, but if you want okay. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever you want, yep. you know, yep. it'll, yep. It'll, 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 it'll happen. So it's fine. Brilliant, brilliant, wonderful. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie Sims. I head up um, our strategic pension relationships at LTP and have also set up our professional trustee engagement program. Um, about 10 years ago. It's a program that really enables all of us at LCP to engage proactively with professional trustees. Um, and four years ago, we launched um, what is now a well-known survey. Um, four years ago, it was probably less well-known. It's called Soulmates, slight play on words here. It is not just a sole trustee survey. It is a professional trustee survey. Um, where we try and um, tap into the mood music of the market every year by um, showing you the state of play um, currently with professional trustees and um, trustees overall. Laura, over to you. Thanks, Matt. So I'm um, Laura Min, partner in the actuarial team at LCP. Um, so I advise kind of in the day job um, trustees, I'm a scheme actuary, but I also have corporate clients. But in addition to that kind of role, I also support Nats with our professional trustee network and relationship management um, and for this year I've been involved in the preparation of our summit survey so kind of the findings that we're sharing with you today. Fantastic can everybody see the slides I've got them on my screen here Sam has kindly shared them. Yep Great. all good. Awesome. Wonderful. Up. So fantastic so the agenda for um, the call today um, is, is walking you through the survey itself in case you haven't read it we won't go into all the details happy to share a link to the survey can be found on the LCP website as well if you just type in soulmates make sure you um, read the one with the butterflies on not the one from the year before um, so to get us started we'll talk about the growth of the market um, of professional trustee and corporate sole trustee um, talk about the current landscape and um, the different firms um, services that are currently being offered, um, traditional trustee services and services beyond traditional trusteeship, and um, the sole trustee landscape and what's evolving there, um, tapping slightly into diversity, and then um, finishing up with TPR, um, what the future looks like, um, especially based on what we heard last week at the PLSA conference. Um, to get us started, Sam, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, when we launched Soulmates, it was always always quite interesting to hear and see what the press picks up and what the highlights are that um, kind of stand out from the survey. We try to give them quite a lot of materials, but um, helpful to see the headlines um, that we see. And, and quite a lot um, of articles or publications have picked up on the fact that professional trusteeship seems to be the new normal. We've um, hit um, a point where more schemes have a professional trustee than not. Um, so 51% to be exact. Um, and so it's it's that headline, but also the fact that there's quite a lot of concentration risk um, or concentration of the firms and assets amongst the top firms. Next slide, please. 
So looking into um, the growth a little bit more closely, and this is based on the four years since we've started the survey, um, you can see in those donuts that um, the proportion of schemes with a professional trustee has grown quite significantly. So that is the both blue segments, the light blue and the dark blue segments together. Um, the final donut um, that's highlighted in a white box is this year's data and shows that um, over 50% of schemes now have, have a professional trustee. Of that, a quarter have a sole trustee arrangement, and that is probably what has grown the fastest. So you can see from 12% um, in 2021 to 24% now in 2024. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Brilliant. Um, and if we um, look at this in a little bit more detail, um, we have a question, check what is meant by professional trustee? Yes, very good point, um, Peter. So what we have looked at, just because that is how we um, slice and dice the data, it is based on people who call themselves professional trustees working for these firms highlighted here. Um, so we have looked at a range of different firms um, and these are accredited professional trustees that often have appointments of probably two or more schemes. Um, it does not mean that we wouldn't account for um, individuals who are what we call independent trustees. It's just slightly more challenging to um, add them to our surveys, but it, it probably means that the proportion of schemes with a um, professional trustees or independent trustees is even larger than 51%. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, looking, into, looking into these um, this chart in a little bit more detail, I appreciate it's quite small, so um, it can be expanded if in the in the survey itself. We looked at, in, at all the, these different firms and um, you can very quickly see the growth by the chart. So the yellow or orangey chart is this year. Um, and we have accounted for the number of appointments. Um, and you can see that there has been strong growth across the board, really, of, of the individual firms. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and what is really interesting here is that these firms, um, different firms focus on different size of schemes. So these donuts, what they intend to do is look at um, the left one, looks at the AUM breakdown, breakdown so asset under management that these um, firms look after in terms of um, schemes. And the donut on the right looks at the breakdown per number of schemes. And just to highlight a few here, um, highlighting um, probably IGG, because I, I spotted somebody from IGG on the call here today, um, we've got um, the light green bar, which is at 23% in terms of AUM, and at 15% in terms of the number of appointments, which shows that it's it's kind of fairly balanced, but um, it does demonstrate that at IGG will look at, has a, a client base of slightly larger schemes compared to some of the others. If I was to pick up somebody on the other extreme, it would probably be um, a firm like, doo -doo -doo. Maybe, maybe Zedra, the dark green one, which has only a 6% share in the AUM bit. So compared to 23, that is quite a big shift. Um, and then looking at a 7% in terms of, of, of uh, number of appointments. So it's, um, it's just helping us when we help sponsors in finding the right professional trustee with the right fit, having a better understanding in terms of what kind of size of schemes these firms are um, focusing on. The thing that sprang out um, quite quite um, starkly here was that 90% of the total AUM um, with professional trustees sits across five professional trustee firms. So that's quite a big concentration of schemes with five firms. Um, Conscious Laura, um, I think you're covering the next slide. So I'll yep. give you a little bit <laughs> of you a rest. to speak as well. <laughs> so next slide, please, Sam. Thanks, Matt. So, um, this year was the first year that we looked at headcount and recruitment by a professional trustee firm in our survey. Um, and the chart shown on uh, the slide in front of you, I appreciate it looks a bit busy, but kind of summarises the data that we collated. So the um, bar chart reflects the headcounts as at each of the firms with the different colour bars reflecting different roles. Um, so um, a few points to note from, from that data, the first being clearly there are kind of three standout firms in terms of the 
by size in terms of headcount um, and also across those three and, and more broadly across the the whole kind of breadth of the professional trustee firms there is um there are some trends with regards to the proportions of trustee director roles which are the um dark blue role uh, dark blue bar sorry and non-trustee director roles which are the um pink and the gray bars um and specifically the pink bars are the kind of non-trustee director but still client facing staff so for some organizations for some of the firms this represents um trustee secretarial support trustee exec support the kind of trust trustee directors effectively of tomorrow um but also for some of the firms it reflects um recruitment into kind of tangential uh, areas um, and, and other potential supporting service lines. Um, so you can see that kind of IgG, um, again noting some of my IgGs on the call, does have that kind of um, balance or, or different balance versus some of the other firms there. You also see the likes of um, Best Trustees, Capital Cranfield um, and to an extent um, uh, Zedra having a higher relative proportion of the kind of pure trustee director type roles versus some of the other organisations. Um, and we, we will go on to touch upon this, but this kind of reflects the different structures of the firms and um, different approach to market um, and different breadth of services potentially offered. What we see under, in terms of the, the little heads that um, are below the bars uh, represents the recruitment by each of the firms that we surveyed over the course of the year. Um, and this kind of shows a similar trend to the to the headcount, really, in terms of um, those three slightly more standout firms of Dariad, IGG and Vedette also recruiting heavily over the year and um, kind of as reflected by the headcount with the relative size of these scheme uh, of these firms. Um, by way of contrast, obviously, we see that, that some of the smaller firms had, had slightly lower rates of recruitment as, as one would expect. Um, if we shift on to the next slide, Sam. Um, so I, as a reference before, the kind of pink bars, as I refer to them, showed that some of the firms are recruiting into um, non trustee roles um, and roles that kind of support wider offerings in terms of services. Um, and, and that is, is no secret. And there's that expansion of services beyond traditional trusteeship into governance related services that's been going on a kind of a trend that's been happening for a number of years now. Um, and in part, that's um, been reflected in the top right hand kind of word cloud in terms of this was by frequency, how many um, kind of times that the various alternative or, or additional services were referenced by our respondents in the survey. So you can see the secretariat roles, the pensions management, project management are all um, recurring. Um, references so um, services that most of the uh, most of the firms provide. There are some um, exceptions, notably pan trustees, and there's a quote from um, Nick of, of pan trustees there with respect to them focusing purely on traditional trusteeship, so that so they don't kind of even move into the trustee secretarial space, and that's a kind of commercial decision for their organisations. Um, we're also seeing a slightly extended expansion of services into lights of procurement, um, communications. Um, we saw around half the firms reference procurement in their responses. Um, we've also seen IGG and Dalraya to provide comm services um, and IGG also providing FM oversight. Um, and, and so this has been an, an area of um, expansion and, and of interest and, and various kind of market commentary out there. It's also something that was touched upon. Um, people, which is really bad. Oops, sorry. Is that a question? Or? No, no, carry on. Yeah, um, it was kind of noted in terms of um, TPR's announcement at the end of last week with regards to their kind of active engagement with the firms in an area that they wanted to, uh, they reference wanting to understand more about is, is how firms um, kind of approach market, the market um, and in particular around kind of the tangential or supporting service lines. So, so that will be an interesting area of discussion, I suspect, over the coming months. Um, Kind of related to that announcement last week, we also asked our um, respondents in the bottom left um, is where we show the results there. We asked the respondents uh, of areas where TPI guidance we welcomed um, and there was a, a continued theme of um, understanding how independence conflicts um, should or could be managed or TPR's perspective on, on those areas and no doubt the kind of active engagement that we're now seeing from TPR will add more colour into that and provide those firms with that guidance or um, insight or support that, that they were looking for. Sam, next slide please. 
Thank you. Um, so we then moved on to look at Sultra Sea landscape, as Nat said, that wasn't the main focus of this uh, report, but it has been a continued area of focus and, and a continued momentum in terms of the growth of Sultra Sea ship, um, with, as Nat said, about half of the professional trustee appointments now re reflecting a sole trustee appointment. Um, and we now have around 75 billion based on our survey of assets under management under sole trusteeship. Um, and also, interestingly, a growing number of sole trustee appointments at the larger end of the market had traditionally um, been the focus of smaller schemes, arguably, or a, a, an approach that was most uh, suited, arguably, to smaller schemes. Um, but there is that growth at the larger end as well as um, opportunities have arisen and as these larger schemes have looked to alternative governance models. It's worth noting, as um, everyone on this call will be aware, that the sole trustee doesn't represent kind of a single trustee acting in that capacity. So it's, we're not suggesting that there are, is there a four, there's a four billion pound scheme out there with a, a single individual kind of responsible sole trusteeship um, requires in terms of the APP to, to code at least two trustees to be involved in the decision making. Um, and the different firms have um, establish their own governance models that reflect the APPT guidance, but they've gone about it in, in slightly different um, ways, which um, we may well cover over leaf, Sam. I'm now struggling to remember the next slide, but yeah, perhaps next slide, please, Sam. Thank you. So yeah, so this is um, how we've um, simplified the models and categorised them for the purpose of kind of um, putting each of the firms into a box, as it were. But it's worth saying that there are shades of grey in between these and different firms take slightly different approaches. Um, but, but broadly, we um, kind of looked at, or we categorise them by three approaches, three models. So the first being where there is a, a clear lead trustee with a co-trustee support. Um, and, and most of the firms kind of take that approach by, by number, as it were. Um, and additional trustees can be brought in, obviously, within uh, with cert certain issues or circumstances. Model two is then where there is a lead trustee, but um, which, who would act as the main point of contact, for example, to the sponsor, and they're supported by two or more co-trustees. It's, it's almost like a pseudo trustee board but within that sole trustee model and then model three there are two clear clear kind of equal lead trustees as it were in that space with equal responsibility for the appointment um and it therefore effectively operates kind of a, a two man as it were trustee or woman um trustee board in that sense but it, that is all within the kind of the realms of sole trusteeship so um, as, as I'm sure all of you will be aware on the call, that there's that opportunity to move away from um, the traditional kind of quarterly meeting cycle, et cetera, under sole trusteeship. And a number of the firms have extended their sole trustee offerings in terms of the, their governance approaches and their uses of um, technology, for example, in terms of making use of platform-based governance tools to monitor decisions in real time and to kind of interact um, with their advisors and um, also just kind of more on a more basic level, potentially the streamlining of their trustee policies across their sole trustee clients um, and across uh, of their teams. So individuals in each of these organizations may well focus on sole trustee clients and kind of drive efficiencies by that focus being um, on their sole trustee book. It's probably worth adding that um, what we haven't highlighted in this um, simplified chart is where, um, for example, consultative committees would sit alongside the lead trustees and the co-trustees. So um, just, just to take a step back, um, sometimes what happens is when a sole trustee replaces a full trustee board, the member nominated trustees would um, ha are sometimes asked to stay on either to help with the transition or to help with um, getting getting to know the scheme or running the scheme with because they have that prior knowledge having been trustees for a number of years. So um, the sole trustees often welcome um, what is called a consultative committee, which would be formed by a selection of member nominated trustees who would stay on. Um, support as and when needed. They wouldn't necessarily attend every single meeting or call, but they would be there at structured times or um, to call upon. And um, I guess they would be considered an additional um, pink pool of co-trustees. So they would be considered as an additional sounding board um, when decisions are being made or questions are being asked. Um, and one of the areas, um, I know Maggie's on the call, so I know I don't know if Maggie, if you would like to add anything, but one of the areas where having member nominated trustees or consultative committee input is really, really helpful is for communication because they understand how some decisions can be best communicated with members. But that's to be clear, that's not the only role they play. And they have a lot of knowledge about um, the scheme and are very helpful when it comes to supporting in various decisions that are being made. So. Um, 
that's kind of just just for for the full picture that's where they would sit sorry laura back to you no obviously and um, i've got anecdotal um, experience myself I, i'm schematic to a few schemes with sole trustee appointments um and and with consultative committees or individuals who previously were MNTs involved and they do bring up a wealth of um, experience and expertise in terms of the membership and often very useful historic knowledge, uh, particularly when it comes to transition or kind of insurance transactions, etc, where the, the devil is in the detail of those previous specific promises that may well have been made back in the day. Yeah. <coughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, so moving on, so I touched on sole trusteeship and the streamlining of the governance related tasks or um, actions as it were activity. Some firms have also extended that to, to develop their own streamlined full service sole trustee solution for um, typically smaller schemes in order to capitalise on the efficiencies of the sole trustee model. And um, shown on the slide are kind of three of the key um, offerings out there in the market or the main offerings that were out there in the market. Um, so those being from Del Rieda in terms of the Del Rieda together proposition, the M plan pension platform, which um, the, for which the trustee is Entrust Limited with ICO being the, the advisory, um, uh, the advisor in that context. And, and then Ignite where IGG is a professional trustee, full trustee, and they operate with um, panel firms uh, of advisors to um, offer the streamlined service. Um, much like Darreda, I should have said Darreda operate in that similar manner of having panel-based firms. Um, so it, it's an interesting developing, evolving area in terms of um, driving efficiencies at the small end of the market, and, and there are clear, kind of clearly kind of pros and cons. Um, also, it's worth noting that these solutions kind of sit in a, a broad spectrum of um, governance models for, particularly for smaller schemes, um, and notable kind of alternatives are, uh, are the master trust space. So there are master trust solutions out there, which um, some smaller schemes kind of look to compare against these sole trustee offerings. So I think I hand back to you now at this stage. Yep, yeah. So unless there are any more questions or comments um, about sole trusteeship, we were going to move on to um, DEI and then wrap up with um, looking into the future and TPR. There's one question. Um, how would you respond to the suggestion that sole trustee is a regulator in residence rather than guardian of the member interests? So I think there's... Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think some of this speaks to what we were just talking through, perhaps in terms of th there's a level of uh, sole trustee can bring some degree of awareness or greater awareness, arguably, of the regulatory regime, and they will abide by the APPT code in terms of their own approach to the governance governance through sole trusteeship. But there is that balance of maintaining member interest and member insight, and that's where the role of, of the consultative committees, the kind of um, supporting previous MNTs who might stay on, as in this case I've got for a couple of my schemes, do bring that wealth of experience. And also, ultimately, um, from my anecdotal experience, again, the, the trustees, the sole trustees of my schemes are very much aware of the, the member interest and member angle that, in fact, to some extent, they're kind of hyper aware of that in the context of having moved from a professional trustee board um, where there have been member trust nominated trustees involved to um, that sole trustee space. So I think there is an awareness. There's a steps that certain schemes and sole trustees are taking to address through the consultative committees, etc. But um, there will be examples out there where that you know that may not be the case i, I think good examples definitely exist though yeah. just taking the questions in turn and there were a few questions um i i'm sorry i'm um calling you pf but i don't know who you are i can only see pf with no camera on so um your question please you've got your hand up is that me yes you, Podrick. <laughs> yep yep Podrick, hello. you, you hello. Yeah. Ah. Fine. Okay. My apologies. Okay. I, was, I got held up on a call, so no, no, that's fine. Early, and my apologies, but I just got a quick question for you about um, this so-called streamlined and full service model. Um, have you know any? Have you any concerns, or do you know if TPR has any concerns about this as a potential governance um, obstacle in itself, whereby you have a sole trustee effectively uh, channeling other parts of their own business? towards the uh, employer so that they gobble up all of the potential revenue streams from one provide one employer because you know that surely those conflicts of interests are 
are the kinds of things we've been talking about for 25 years and I've been talking about for 25 years in the bigger companies. But there seems to be a bit of a, well, there seems to be a bit of a blind eye being turned at the lower end of the market. So I just wondered if you've got any comments mm. on that. Yeah, I mean, from, from where we're sitting, um, we we see the firms that we survey, the firms that we work with, having self-imposed checks and balances. Um, and we know that TPR are going to take a closer look at the way these firms run sole trustee services and generally professional trustee services and how wider services are being offered. Um, I'm very aware that the new leadership or change, change of personnel at TPR is now very focused on potential systemic risks in the market more generally, which includes professional trustee firms, just like it, it will include um, consultants, just like it includes other providers. Um, the what is really interesting as well is that the APPT, the Association of Professional Pension Trustees, um, a number of years ago got together to um, create a code of conduct for sole trusteeship, which, um, so Laura already alluded to the fact that there needs to be two accredited trustees on each account, but um, it also means that services have to be reviewed regularly. There needs to be a, an order trail of that having been done. So when that happens, um, that will mean that they will have to review their own services if they provide their own services. So um, I'm not saying it is conflict free or it is risk free, um, but there are as many checks and balances in place as they can possibly at the moment. I guess the jury's still out as to what TPR are going to look for when they enter into these new relationships with the 10 largest firms. Yeah, um, but that means they're marking their own work, aren't they, at the moment? Um, there's yeah. no independent, there's no requirement for independent audit, is there, as far as their service is concerned? And what worries me as well is there's a number of private equity companies standing behind some of these these companies so um you know i know i'm i am cynical about these things but um uh, private equity is not generally in 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 the business of um, pursuing the most rigorous um governance above and beyond building business so are, are you are you are you do you have any concerns about that or do you think it's just going to be something that's going to come out in the wash once they've dealt with the big schemes as far as consolidation and so forth is concerned so um, th the role of the private equity firm, let's just take take the few the few aspects in turn. So the role of the private equity firm, I don't think is meant to oversee or provide an independent review of the um, checks and balances in place. They, they provide capital into this market and they have clearly identified an area that is growing quite quickly um, and they are therefore investing into that space. With regards to having concerns, we have quite a few schemes at LCP that have either sole trustee or traditional trustees so far, but that's a, a, a sample that we look at. Um, we don't have co concerns per se, but we we look for them and we look for, for potential conflicts of interests. Um, we work with sophisticated people, sophisticated firms. So from our perspective, it's been fine so far. And um, that's not to say that something might come up in the wash um, and there might be a scheme where all services are being provided by one firm. And yes, they are marking their own homework, but there might be a reason why they have all services provided by one firm. So it's a, it's not a yes and it's not a no, I guess. It's um, it's something we can discuss for hours. <laughs> um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on to Henry's question. And then there is one other question um, by somebody, and I can't see your name, Adrian. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay, Henry, Henry first. Yeah, Henry. Yeah. We can't, I can't I hear you're you. On mute, maybe, Henry. You're on mute, Henry, I think. Try again. Or maybe type your question into the chat. Yeah, okay, let's go to, uh, let's go to Adrian. Adrian. And then, um, Adrian, oh, and then guys, come back to Henry. I hope you can hear me all right. Yeah. Um, a, a quick question, really, in terms of uh, other examples of sole trusteeship in the, the DC Master Trust space. I am not aware of Or is that something that TPR would, would, would frown upon? I am not aware of any. I'm aware that there are lots of different professional trustees that sit on DC Master Trusts. I'm also aware, actually, that was something that was discussed quite heavily um, when I attended TPR's Board Strategy Day um, last year um, as the person who was um, talking about professional trusteeship and DC Master Trust was also on the agenda. And they were saying that there might be potential risks um, of having 
too few professional trustees on the DC Master Trusts because potentially, you know, there are conflicts of interest, but there's also a concentration risk. So I'm aware that um, the Master Trusts have become quite strict about not appointing professional trustees that sit on other DC Master Trusts. Um, but um, if anybody in here is aware of sole trustee in DC Master Trust, please shout. Um, Henry and Maggie, you've got your hand up as well. Henry, I don't know if we can hear you now, otherwise you might need to type it in the chat. I still can't hear you, sorry. Henry, put it in the chat and you'll, you've got a problem. Uh, Maggie, let's go to you, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was sort of waiting till the end, but I think we look as if we're going round the questions now. I mean, I'm talking for AMNT really, what we're concerned about isn't actually the behaviour of professional trustees, it's the behaviour of employers and the fact that what's going on, you know, the 95 Act set up how to set up a master trust, how to set up a trustee board, and that was the rules. And somehow there is this bit that says if you bring in sole trustees, you can just ignore all of that. Um, we know that the good professional trustees do bring their consultative committees, but a consultative committee still isn't the same as sitting around the board table. You only get to answer the questions you're asked. Um, but I'm busy. I'm seeing adverts go through. I think they'd probably regret that I was on the end of the advert, but just from a financial ma fiduciary management firm just saying, hello, employers. Would you like to have more influence over your pension scheme? Would you like to control the investment process? Why not go to so sole trusteeship? You can do this at the drop of a hat. And we're seeing perfectly good functioning trustee boards being dismissed because employers didn't like what they were being asked to do. Uh, if they're being asked for contingent assets and things like this, suddenly you find that they're going to sole trusteeship. And I do hear from sole trustees I have conversations with about their difficulties in saying no to employers when employers seem to think they're going to do whatever they want. So there is a the whole problem with this sole trusteeship is that it's being seen as a way for employers to control the scheme. Um, and so it's not about the trustees, but it, it becomes increasingly difficult if a sole trustee professional sole trustee says to the employer, we're not prepared to do that, they effectively have to say, so sack us then. And if they do sack them, they will find another professional trustee firm that will do it and they'll keep going. And there isn't a, there isn't a requirement for your professional, for your sole trustees to be professional trustees under the APPT scheme or anything else. In the end, you can appoint anybody you like. There's no rules about it at all. So my concern is there's no governance to this process. Um, thanks, Maggie. Lots of, lots of hands raised, Natalie. Now, yeah, so yeah, I can see that. Opened I up think, a, a can. <laughs> oh gosh, a can, a can of work. Let's let's put the slides down because um, the rest you can all read in your own time. And so it's helpful to answer the question, Maggie. Thank you for your observations. Um, fair to say that some in some instances I agree with you, and some I don't. Um, we have seen sole trustees being appointed um, for reasons other than not agreeing with the sponsor. Sometimes um, it, it can be more efficient to run a scheme that way. Sometimes there are limited funds available. Um, having streamlined propositions sometimes is, is um, helpful in terms of cost savings, um, or we've been in situations where trustees would love to continue being trustees, but they're at a point of retirement and they're really struggling to recruit trustees. And then, you know, we've run selections recently actually where the trustees have chosen the sole trustee, not the sponsor, the sponsor had input. And they were very, very clear about setting quite strict KPIs to ensure that the sole trustee they appointed is, as much aligned with the trustees um, or how the trustees have been for many, many years as possible. So, um, but I hear your concerns and um, I'm hoping that things like the trustee register that TPR have announced might um, actually help with monitoring how often trustees or sole trustees get switched over to possibly say yes or no to, to the sponsor. So, so um, I, I note it, but um, as I say, so sometimes, um, you know, I have to disagree with you. Sorry, Maggie. Um, who Who's next? 
Okay, we've in got Hen Henry's question is in the chat now, so uh, okay. we can read that. Have to. So I was... Can you see that, Natalie? I can see it. I'm going to read it out. Um, Henry, my question is about have to rather than want to, referring to Con's point. Are we concerned that PTs are simply focusing on compliance with the various codes established by the pensions regulator? Discretion. Um, yes and no, Henry. Um, I'm, I'm, go I'm, I'm in a fortunate position that you can't actually answer me back now, but um, yes and no. Yay! <laughs> I, I guess it's more than compliance and we've got very close relationship with, the, with those professional trustees and, and they are really focusing on what's best for members. I appreciate that it, they, it is a commercial organization. They are all doing this as a career, um, but they want to do what's right. And I have also seen trustees push back heavily to what the sponsor wants or think a bit more creatively about what can be done to um, enhance member benefits. So it's not all black or white. Um, appreciate that the compliance aspect is actually one or the regulatory aspect is one often a reason why professional trustees get appointed in the first place because they um some of the the trustees um without a professional trustee might not be aware of new regulation coming in or might not be on top of it or have the right frameworks or as one example or ESOC being one example where they would have to start from scratch. Having a professional trustee might help with a framework that they've already um, worked on in the past. So that might save costs, it might make things more efficient. So it, it's a give and take. There is compliance involved, but there's also, um, it's also about doing what's right for the members. Um, Laura, did you wanna, I saw you- no, was just the yes. point around um, kind of the regulatory burden and the impact that has on management time. So often um, in cases where um, the trustees themselves are ENTs or their ENTs or even the MNTs are active in the business, it's kind of uh, removing time effectively or management time that arguably the company perceives could be um, better spent elsewhere and, and with outsourcing effectively of that to a professional trustee. Um, but there are, again, pros and cons as we've talked through. Yeah, okay. Um, should we go to Bob now, Natalie? Bob Compton, yep. do you want Bob. to unmute Bob? Let's hope we can hear them. We'll come Just to Bob. unmuting now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Right. Um, really, it's, it's a bit of history, a bit of background, and, and sort of backing up on what Maggie was saying with regard to sole trustees. Um, the APPT was formed back in 2003 by Frank Field basically questioning individual sole trustees closing down and winding up small uh, pension schemes, particularly small self administered schemes, and charging what they liked. And basically, Frank Bill wanted to uh, ask the question, is there an independent professional body for trustees? And I got asked by David Laverick back in 2002, is there a body? And I said, no, there isn't. But we, you know, if you want, we can try and do something about that. And that led to what is now the APPT, with the idea of providing professional codes of conduct or guidance to professional trustees in the way they operate. So Maggie, the, the intention would be that, um, that the, the industry body, either the APPT, would provide some sort of guidance as to how sole trustees actually operate. But it is a real worry that if sole trustees are being driven by financial incentives, not by a trustee fiduciary duty, that it could become um, a bit of a problem, particularly where they are running other services as well. And I know that the regulator would be looking at that. Now, for my sins, I also got asked by David Fares to chair one of the industry working groups looking at trustees. And I got asked to look at the data research and innovation aspects. And that led to the survey of trustees, which carried out last summer, summer of 2023. And the, uh, the report was produced in and published in March of this year. Um, part of our work that we did as part of that uh, industry working group was to look at what data the regulator had on trustees and it was very scarce and scratchy uh, and that's why we made the suggestion that there should be some form of register as there is in companies health for individual directors of companies so exactly the same situation and as Natalie is saying that hopefully will throw a light on how sole trustees are operating but the problem is that if companies are moving down the road or sole trustees are actually selling their services on the basis that, you know, if we're a sole trustee and we're being paid by you, Mr. Company, Mr. Sponsor, we'll do your bidding. 
And that is a big worry, and the regulator will no doubt pick up on that. That's just some background. That was just my comments, uh, uh, Steve. Okay, so no, no question. Um, thanks, Bob. That's that's really helpful. And I know we've worked on on a working group together um, where you were wearing a different hat. So um, really helpful insights. Thank you. Um, is Bobby next? Bobby, yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, thanks. It was just to come back again on Maggie's question. I know it wouldn't solve some of the, all the conflicts there, but scheme actuaries have a requirement when they are changed that they have to inform the next scheme actuary who comes in if there's anything they should be aware of in terms of conflicts and issues that they've had on the account, and that's to stop scheme actuaries being fired just because they're not doing the bidding of the employer. I would totally welcome that in trustee world. Uh, and if that would have to come higher than the APPT though, because you can be accredited by either the APPT or the PMI. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be something that the regulator would probably have to put in place. But I think that would actually make the, I, I just uh, anecdotally, I've seen professional trustees in difficult situations in the past where they've been fired for issues and, the, and it they for them to take on themselves to then go and report something is yeah. is very hard yeah. so i think a very you could you could put that across in consulting and other areas not just scheme actuary but i think the most obvious area to put it on now next would be professional trustees just make sure that every single change professional trustee that trustee has to give a, a report to the new trustee Mm. And, and the clue includes any particular issues that, that were ongoing. Mm. That's a, a really good suggestion, Bobby. I, I really like that. And I, I'll certainly, I'm very happy to raise that when we have our conversations with uh, TPR and DWP, as you can imagine, um, on the back of Soulmates. Um, both industry bodies have um, expressed an interest to talk more about our findings. So very happy to talk to them about it. And um, if if um, you are one of the 10 firms TPR talks to, um, feel free to mention it to them as well. Um, there's one more question, unless there's any any more hands up. I'm, I can't see both pages, no. Um, do you think that the position with regards to having trustees not having possible conflicting interests in DC Master Trust will come across to DB schemes, in particular targeting a buyout endgame? Really good um, question, Peter. I guess it isn't the case at the moment. What we're seeing is that... Um, in similar sectors, sponsors are quite careful about appointing um, the same professional trustee for obvious reasons. Um, appreciate that um, a professional trustee could have five different appointments of which say four schemes are all targeting buyout, all competing with each other. I guess that's no different to a very busy pensions risk transfer team where say a partner has got two deals on at the moment or three deals on at the moment. So um, there needs to be a conflicts protocol in place to ensure that one is not competing with the other. I'm also conscious that um, these different schemes will might be targeting buyout, might be speaking to different insurers. Um, but yes, good, really good point and probably worth thinking about um, when um, you appoint a busy professional trustee to ensure that um, the scheme isn't competing with another one when it um, targets end game. Peter, you just raised Peter. your hand. And then yes. Rosalind, you've made a comment as well, Rosalind, but we'll come to Peter first. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, 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 sorry, thanks for responding to the point on the question. And um, I uh, just wanted to say that I was absolutely shocked at a presentation uh, seminar, which I won't mention, um, where a professional trustee from one of the big three companies said, uh, when asked the question about the role of lay trustees, said, oh, there's no role for them. A professional trustee can get, get the scheme to buy out far quicker uh, without lay trustees than if there were lay trustees involved and they had to explain their actions. I was absolutely shocked by that, but that was stated in a public forum by a professional trustee. Um, so uh, I think that I think probably everybody on this call would be absolutely shocked by that. Um, but um, uh, that is the uh, unfortunately is at least the attitude of at least one person who is supposed to be a representative of that industry. Um, yeah, I would agree with you, Peter. There's definitely a role for lay trustees. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, uh, Rosalind, do you want to unmute and just make your point or come back yeah. on, on Peter's point as well? But yeah, go on. Yeah, I think it was just in relation to uh, I, I thought the, the the issue that Maggie raised, which I think is is the one that that I think she she articulated really well. The the, the worry we all have uh, around sole trusteeship, and look, we all know that most trustees whatever role they're taking, try to do the right thing. And I'd also say that most employers are not trying to stuff over their pension scheme. However, my worry about this uh, scenario is particularly when the selling of this product, and it has started to be sold as a commodity product, has been increasingly, well, I've seen increasing numbers of people and, and people have mentioned some of them today, either saying, you know, we're there to help the employer, guide the employer and assist the employer with our sole trusteeship, or saying um, very specifically, we will, we commit to lower your, your professional costs by X, which I think is a, a dangerous place to start, is that that involves people, as it were, self-regulating. I think sole trustees, it's not in most cases that they demand something and they or they ask for something reasonable and the company fires them and replaces them with someone else. It's that they don't ask for the more difficult things because that's where that's part of what they've been selling is that they're commercially minded, etc. Um, mm. And I think that is a risk that didn't exist when you didn't have sole trusteeship because you're not you know, when you just had a professional chair, you, you just had a person who, if you like, could guide people and use their expertise. Now you've got sole trusteeship that it, it buck stops only with that sole trustee. And I do think there's a risk there. And I, I'm not saying it's happening all the time, but I think as an industry, we have to recognise it's there and think about ways we can deal with it rather than just saying, oh, I'm sure it won't happen, because I think it does happen because people self-regulate, not because anyone's trying to do anything wrong. Rosalind, sorry, my question would be, do you think the firm should be one or the other? Do you think the regulator might turn around and say, well, you should either be a sole trustee firm or an independent trustee firm, not both? Is that mm -hmm. potentially on the cards? I don't know if that helps as much. I think the problem to me is, and I, the, there's a real advantage with sole trusteeship in, particularly when there's a lot of process to get through and you don't want to get a whole bunch of people up to speed who you don't particularly need to know about it. But I think fundamentally there is, there is a problem with sole trusteeship and we need to find a way of dealing with it. And to me, the best way of dealing with it is, is if I could do something, I would find a way of discouraging the packaging of this product as something that will save you money and will stop all awkward questions being asked, because that does get said a lot and it, it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather really helpful points. I've taken lots of notes here, so thank you. I guess what we're all assuming, just, just one other thought, is we're all assuming that we're talking about sponsors who are really interested in their scheme, which we would hope all sponsors should be, but not that's unfortunately not the case. Um, we often see that when we interact with overseas sponsors, they might not be interested in the UK scheme or might have little knowledge of um, the, the regulatory aspects of the UK pension scheme. We also assume that um, all trustees, I'm not on professional trustees, just generally trustee boards are really engaged, really keen to be involved. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So we've come across um, trustees who just either don't have the time or don't have the will to carry on. So in these situations, having someone take over, whether it's sole trustee or, or a mini board, is helpful. Um, and sometimes it does result in fee sa and cost savings just because of the way things have been run in the past and there are more efficient ways of doing it. Now, having said that, that's not the solution to everything. Um, and there is a time and a place for a sole trustee appointment and there's a time and place to keep a board as it is and be engaged. And um, not every professional trustee board needs, not every trustee board needs a professional trustee. So, um, you know, there are very large boards that, I speak to that don't have a professional trustee and they're run 
very efficiently and the member nominated trustees are absolutely brilliant and asking all the right questions and being engaged and doing the pre-work and the reading and so it's not a one-size-fits-all um, but there is a place for a more efficient way of running things when the sponsor is disengaged or um, there, there are the, the, the trustees are no longer available or around. Okay, fantastic. Um, obviously, we haven't touched much upon the independent sort of part of your role uh, and your review, your survey. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left or eight minutes left, but Maggie, you put your hand up again. Let's just come back to you, Maggie. Um, I know you're very passionate about obviously the... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, actually, it was a different bit and a page that I don't think we got to, which was about the fact, I can't remember, is it 40% um, of professional trustees and 30% of sole trustee firms are appointed without a tender process? Um, and yeah. we're coming back to governance again, this sort of, um, like we were talking about, yes, there are trustee boards that aren't working and the trustee boards that are, but the powers are being used indiscriminately. And we need to have a process where you say, OK, this board isn't working. Perhaps sole trusteeship is the answer. But yeah. that at least involves the board knowing what's happening. Um, we hear you know, trustees who suddenly get an email that says, by the way, you're not a trustee anymore. Yeah. Um, the trustee board hasn't been part of the consultation or necessarily part of the reason. And yeah. if you appoint people without a tender process, well, that's sort of a bit of a recipe for a problem coming down the line, I suspect, as well. Yeah. So, yeah, really. It is, it is all like, back to this thing needs to be yeah. better governed in the process of handover. Absolutely. And, and I think it is that broader point also around transparency. And I think transparency supports also acknowledging our awareness of conflicts of interest where they arise and therefore appropriate um, kind of treatment of them. Also, to Bobby's point around. Um, that kind of conflicts and the handover process being an opportunity to shine a light on those, arguably having whistleblowing type procedures in place prior to them, which the scheme actuary or the actuarial profession does, obviously, um, as well with regards to conflicts, is also one, one means of, of achieving that. Um, but I think it all speaks to that transparency, which, Maggie, as you say, kind of kicks off from that point of the, the tender process itself um, and the appointment process itself. And we, I don't know if we can share the stats on screen, but our survey did show that there is a polarity uh, across the firms in terms of which firms or or um, the number of firms that will ensure that effectively all uh, appointments that they go for are through a full procurement exercise versus those that um, tend to have a preponderance of, of appointments that do kind of arise organically so to speak and, and don't necessarily go through the the tender process itself yeah yep okay um I think Samantha, you very kindly posted the slides um, for everybody's benefit. And obviously, um, if anybody wants a copy and they can't download it from the chat, then um, please contact me or Henry. Um, so that would be that would be great. Um, and there's a link as well, Natalie. Thank you for that as well. Um, sure. So sure. the the link the link is actually um, to our DB Pensions Conference on the 12th of November, where we have some guest speakers, including Maggie. So looking forward to hear more um, from her. We've got panelists there. And uh, one of the morning um, sessions is around the future of trusteeship. So we will be taking this conversation a step further um, and talking about a range of different things. So um, looking forward to continuing the conversation. You're all welcome to sign up, to join. Um, hopefully, hopefully see you there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, Peter, you've, do you want to unmute Peter and just make your, your point there regarding legislation? What is your point on that, Peter? Yeah, I was just uh, picking up um, about the, uh, the fact that um, uh, it's almost from what Maggie was saying about the tendering process um, should not be under the control of the existing trustees uh, with the employer requesting a tendering process is entered. But then if you think about that, why shouldn't the members be able to request the uh, potential replacement of mm. the trustee board? Uh, through a tendering process. Just a thought. So it's just just better governance, better stewardship of the review process. That's what you think will be good. Yeah, yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, the only person we haven't heard from today, apart from there's a lot of lovely people on this call, but Con Keating, you, I think you mentioned something earlier, but Con, what's your closing remarks then uh, on uh, the, the state of the sole trustees versus independent trustees and their role? 
I don't know if you're still with us, Colin, but um, um, if uh, if you could um, comment on that, that'd be great. Uh, or Henry, is your um, is your uh, mute now working, Henry, or not working? Uh, we still can't hear you, but um, uh, my, you... my um, here we go. Con Mike yep. is now working, Steve. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, my concern here is that. As we go to a world where we have sole trustees, we will find ourselves being more and more um, compliant with the wishes of the pensions regulator. Um, and the pensions regulator has a clear agenda, um, which is in conflict with the productive investment agenda of this government. Um, and indeed, um, not or far from optimal in terms of the pensions which members can expect. Um, I review, I regard sole trusteeship as being, frankly, fatally flawed. The with a register of trustees being formed uh, by the regulator uh, and presumably the regulator is going to choose who can who they can deny membership of that register um, then sole trustees are going to have a clear commercial interest in satisfying the regulator not their members i think it is potentially uh, a very serious um, risk. Um, and personally, I would resist it greatly. Okay, Natalie, you agree, disagree? Wait, wait, in... till your, wait till your event. <laughs> <laughs> wait till my event. Come on the 12th and find out. I'm conscious that there's one more question by Henry um, on um drawing any conclusions about the character and behavior of trustees and firms owned by pe and those not is there a difference we have one minute left so i'm just going to leave you with three um uh, well the answer three three key points um what we've already seen from firms with pe investment is that they've grown a lot um by headcount so they've hired a lot more people because they just have the capital to do so and um, they have expanded into um wider non traditional trustee services, and we can probably expect further growth through M&A um, transactions or acquisitions, um, just because often, you know, that's what PE firms like to encourage, and they um, often are able to provide introductions, etc. And those are the three areas that I would probably think are more characteristic to firms with um, PE investments, but I'm sure um, we'll be able to see to see that evolve, explore, explore that further as time goes on. Um, it's 11.30. Bang so, on 11.30, I mean, that's, um, that, 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 that's great. Uh, and if anybody's looking in the chat, uh, there's a big uh, comment regarding Henry Tapper's blog on the debate as well. So have a look at Henry Tapper's debate on the blog as well. That'd be really useful. And uh, look, uh, sorry, Natalie, it's free to attend and um yep. it's in november your um, 12th of november in london november. um yes please sign up join us it's for the morning slot so 11 to 12 in the 11 morning to 12. brilliant okay thank you okay so um on behalf of everybody thank you very very much natalie and laura um and samantha for, for joining from lcp great presentation <laughs> lots to talk about lots to fix um you know we think that uh, the industry is moving in the right direction. Hopefully it is, but uh, there are still a great number of issues to uh, to consider. Um, great presentation. The slides are available in the chat if anybody wants to download the slides. If you can't download the slides, come to me or Henry Tapper. and uh, We will send them to you. And uh, thank you so much for joining and uh, hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Let's pray for peace in the East, peace in the Middle East. Lots of clapping, Bobby, virtual clapping, which is excellent. Um, and uh, the, today's video will be up on the website uh, at lunchtime and we'll produce a podcast as well. So really, really appreciate everybody's time and input and questions. Thanks for the clap, Rosalind. Fantastic. And Peter and Jim. That's very kind. Um, please join us next week for uh, Pension Playpen Coffee Morning. And uh, we have a presentation from 
uh, Barnet Waddingham and um, let's uh, see I think that's to do with stewardship and governance but anyway uh, lots and lots of exciting things to talk about and uh, enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the rest of your week and we'll hopefully see you at the next events but uh, Natalie thanks again thank you thanks. Laura and um, really appreciate your time and input thank you All right, thanks, thanks everyone so. Take bye, -bye. Care. bye bye, bye. bye.